Yeah, sure, I'll go first. Um, it's such an honor to be here today speaking on this panel. Thank you so much for having me and thank you so much everyone for being here. I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully everyone can see that. So in my PhD research at Cambridge and in my work as a research fellow at ISGAP, I analyzed the relationship between anti-Semitism and language. More precisely, I investigate how the plasticity of anti-Jewish prejudice informs and inflects the meaning of words used in the articulation of this high dimensional prejudice. Anti-Semitism mutates across time and space to create cultural codes out of specific signifiers. Unfixed terms stand in uneasily for both concrete entities and conceptual concerns that are often misunderstood maliciously deployed or both at the same time. And now with the emergence of what has been called the new anti-Semitism, we are witnessing the crystallization of a new vernacular of Jewish hatred. It is inextricably tied to the geopolitical conflict in Israel-Palestine and it establishes shaky symmetries between Zionism, imperialism, colonialism, racism and Nazism cloaked in the vocabulary of social justice. If for the anti-Semite, the Jew is the center of all evil, now the Jew has morphed into the Jewish state. So where is this conversation taking place? Social media has become a vortex of texts completely stripped of context, subtext, and intertext. By its design, it flattens entire histories of prejudice into easily digestible dichotomies and palatable paradigms of power. Today, I'm going to isolate this one popular meme and do with all of you what it tells us not to do. We're going to read it closely and see how it works. It is perhaps a sad symptom of our age that reading against the grain is an act of reading at all. Are we ready to talk about how those birthright trips to Israel equal colonizer recruitment? They really pay for young Jewish folks to visit to convince them to move over so they expand their white settler colonial erasure of Palestine. It is always hashtag free Palestine for us. Cue the accusations of anti-Semitism for telling the truth and calling out a white settler colonial project. If you are Jewish and find yourself getting offended or defensive at this post, please read the comments from plenty of your Jewish siblings speaking the truth below. A free trip to be recruited to push more Palestinians off their land sounds about white. <laughs> what happens here is swift by capital. And we must remember that one of the most enduring icons of anti-Semitism throughout history is the Jew controlling money. Young Jews outside of Israel are deliberately incorporated into an alleged propagandistic campaign of deceit on the basis of their religion. This basis is then reconfigured into a question of race, specifically the white settler colonial activity which replaces the signifier Jewish. As Jean-Paul Sartre famously argued in Anti-Semite and Jew, if the Jew did not exist, then the anti-Semite would create him. And this speaks to the function of the Jew as a figure, abstraction or trope defining negativity, particularity and otherness. And now we see that the image of the Jew in the eyes of the contemporary anti-Semite is coded as white. Understanding oppression as systemic rather than material or phenomenological, according to critical race theory, neutrality at the letter of the law is impossible. With intersectionality, first introduced by Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989, the amalgamated interaction of persecution is a scale of solidarity and whiteness is no longer a question of being, but of bestowing. Speaking against systemic racism and oppression requires speaking against whiteness, against those who take part in white activity, such as colonialism, against those who support Israel, against those young Jewish folks in the world. That's the circuit of signification taking place here. The caption specifically anticipates and delegitimizes accusations of anti-Semitism. 
it empties the word of meaning altogether. This is a classic example of David Hirsch's Livingstone formation, where accusations of anti-Semitism are rejected by claiming that there is an underlying motive to censoring free speech. Jews control the narrative once more. Deeper still, addressing a specifically Jewish audience becomes a mark of division between good Jews who speak the truth and bad Jews who are either complicit through silence or guilty through a combination of existence and action. This is anti-Semitic according to multiple examples in the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. And for the IHRA definition, intention matters and ignorance is not an excuse. Intention is tricky at the best of times and it is intensely difficult here because it is impossible to read. Adorno and Horkheimer in the Dialectic of Enlightenment characterize this phenomenon as the blindness of anti-Semitism, its lack of intention. And we can read intention here in two different ways, not only the stated purpose or the end goal, but also the underlying motivation or desire. With anti-Semitism, intention is cleverly rewritten and on social media, it is conveniently erased. Anti-Semitism is a blind spot. We have to open our eyes to the complexities of this prejudice and the complicated and very quick ways that words change meaning from medium to message to material existence. For as Hannah Arendt said, evil arises from a failure to think. So I'll leave it there by way of an introduction and I'm looking forward to our conversation together. Thank you, Chloe. Thanks. Sorry, um, Joel, would you like to go next and then Pamela and then I'll follow you guys? Sure. Okay. Great, so first of all, thank you so much for, uh, for having us, uh, Dr. Small, I, Scout. Um, it's an honor to be on this panel. Um, my name is Joel Finkelstein. I'm the director of the Network Contagion Research Institute. Um, we use machine learning um, and uh, uh, big data anal analytics to understand what's happening with contagious bad ideas online um, and how those contagious bad ideas often erupt into episodes of real world violence or mobilizations. Um, and so fundamentally, we focus on the spread of memes, which are either images or words that, uh, that, that capture um, ideologies or capture political grievances, usually they organize people, and we trace their spread between networks of people on social media, um, and then use uh, various forms of analysis to understand how those memes are, you know, predicting radicalization, uh, mobilizations, and violence. So I have to say that of all of the kinds of hatred that the NCRI studies, there is no doubt, I think, in our minds that anti-Semitism is by far the most complex. It stands to reason that's the case because there's no hate that has had the luxury and time of developing against such an obstinate, <laughs> obstinate and enduring foe. Um, and the refusal of the Jewish people to die has created an opportunity for hatred to evolve in ways that are really complex and articulate. The result is that when our tools work on anti-Semitism, we're really confident they're gonna work for everything else because everything else is way lower dimension. The dimensionality of anti-Semitism is much has a lot more complexity to it. There's a lot more color and a lot more dimensionality in, in the hatred than there are other kinds of hates and a lot of implicit contradictions. So, you know, the result is that we we have really used the 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 complexity and power and widespread nature of anti-Semitism to be our canary in the coal mine. You know, when we can validate tools that work there, we know it's going to work for everybody else. Right, so recently, what the NCRI has discovered is a kind of a, a sort of um, blueprint for how anti-Semitism spreads on communities. And the question that we're asking is, given the nature of the structure of social media, what are the relationships between the agents in that medium and in the real world? How are they operating and influencing one another? How are those groups inspiring kinds of mobilizations and forms of hate? Are they feeding off of each other? Can we show the cycles in which a, 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 pol a political leader can speak out to a, a, a group to inspire anger? Can a group speak out with anger to inspire a political leader? Can a foreign nation take advantage of both of those to inject inflammatory ideas that, that circulate there? Can that catch in the media? 
We have to start thinking about these things that way because these memes spread like that, that it, it, it reflects the ways that bad ideas can, can transmit effortlessly from network to network. And the result is something like a hurricane with vector force winds that can come from any of these directions, all of which contribute to things like mobilizations, to violence, and to, and to the spread of radicalization and hate. So the most recent uh, analysis that we did on this, well, this is actually the second most recent analysis that we did on this, was, was uh, with a, let me see if I share my screen. Okay. Was in the study of anti-Semitic disinformation. Um, and Pamela will, will sort of tell you a bit about what anti-Semitic anti -Semitic disinformation is like. What I'm going to do is tell you a bit about how it works. So what we found is that anti-Semitic disinformation has a remarkable set of features that, that in terms of how it's used and who it's used on. We find that it, it attaches to left-wing figures like George Soros, all of the features of, that, that Pamela will share with you that they, they can attach to, to left-leaning people, they can attach to right-leaning people. Um, the conspiracies can attach to people who are darker skinned, they, they can attach to people who are whiter skinned. And the topic networks that we develop basically show that each of these, each of these conspiracies is identical no matter who it attaches to, whether it attaches to the Jew, to George Soros, to Donald Trump, or to the state of Israel. The components of the myth are always the same. So we see that in, in, in the data, but one of the things I'm gonna show you is the, the, the timing of this. Now look at this. Here is a, here is a uh, data that's taken from an extremist community, in this case, uh, 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 Gab in, in the dotted lines, um, 4chan in red, and a mainstream community like Twitter uh, in, in the blue line. What I'm showing you is the rise of Soros conspiracy on these communities over time. And you, you see these peaks? You see how they're all peaking together at these moments? One of the things to notice is that these peaks of convergent Soros activity are occurring first around the election in 2016, the inauguration, Charlottesville, and the attack at Pittsburgh. So during these moments, we see that the, that the crowds, the populist crowds on social media across the different platforms seize together to chant anti-Semitic conspiracies during moments of terrorist attacks or during elections and moments of upheaval. Now we see it during COVID. We're gonna get into that in a moment. But this kind of convergence of, of, of these groups on these memes across platforms all over the world is a very worrying way that, 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 that the anti-Semitism spreads. One of the things to notice is that state actors get in the mix. What I'm showing you here is the activity of Russian trolls um, on 4chan or on, on um, oh, I'm sorry, that, this is, so this is, this is for a different event. Excuse me, I misread that. This is actually um, a different conspiracy, but it shows that, that it's both right and left leaning folks. These are the Russian trolls. So this conspiracy is, is when the embassy moved to Jerusalem and they started talking about all the same conspiracies of Soros, but now they switch it over to Kushner, right? So the exact same conspiracy weaponized against immigrants coming in has now been weaponized against Israel as a colonial force. Now, the interesting thing to notice about the Russian trolls on Twitter is that when we look at their accounts, they promote Kushner memes when the embassy moves, and they promote um, Soros memes during, uh, during the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, they, they apply Kushner memes when, when, uh, is, when the US attacks Syria with missiles back in 2017, and they apply Soros memes during Charlottesville. They have no political allegiance for who they're weaponizing anti-Semitism against, provided that it inflames and divides the country. They'll do it with Soros, they'll do it with Kushner, they'll do it with Israel, they'll do it with Jews. And so they're feeding into these, into the, into the, inf the, inf the inflammation that's happening on these, on these communities in, in synchrony with the communities becoming inflamed themselves. Um, and so what we see is that's also true. That's also true with the use of the visual memes that, that compel the conspiracy. So this is like visual memes of that are just, you know, disgusting beyond belief. I'll see if I can find some examples of them. Here's, here's some examples of some visual memes that, that depict this stuff, right? You know, it's like, you know, the greedy Jew and secretly behind it is, you know, it's secretly behind Trump is this greedy force. Soros is bringing in immigrants to destroy our nation. The idea that Jews are, you know, again, double, double faced, that they, they, they represent double, double faced threat. These memes, when they are disseminating around these communities, 
we see that they also disseminate in synchrony at the moments that I showed you, right? At Charlottesville, at the election of the inaugural Charlottesville. And here in black is the Russian trolls. They really get started back in, in like after 2016 with a lot of these memes. And you can see that they enjoined with the exact same memes that people on 4chan and people on, on, on uh, darker places in Reddit are using. The, the, the crowd is inspiring the Russians for crying out loud, right? And so you see them conjoining in, um, on these operations. Now, why am I telling you this? Because look, this didn't stop with Russia. It didn't start, it didn't stop with 4chan. Now we're seeing the exact same thing happening and we're seeing it happening with Iran. So the NCRI charted the growth of a term called COVID-1948. Here's that term. I just did an analysis of this on Twitter. And we saw that COVID-1948 was, was put out tens of thousands of times right around the time that uh, the, the operation in Gaza uh, began and the recent turmoil occurred across Israel and, and, the, and the territories. Um, what, one of the things that we noted about this was that, of course, you have massive accusations and blood libels that are, are, that are weaponized against Israel, like genocide in Gaza and, and, and uh, terms like this. But COVID-1948 is particularly nasty it suggests that, that the Jewish state is itself a disease that needs to be eliminated. It carries explicitly genocidal contexts. Now, our analysis showed it spiking all at once, which is a hallmark of a, uh, a coordinated, an, an activity of coordinated, a, uh, a sign of coordinated and authentic activity on Twitter. Um, and we saw it spiking in tandem with a lot of, of terms that are, are more familiar and horrible. Hitler was right, Zionazi, death to Israel, death to kill all the Jews. I mean, this is some pretty nasty stuff that started surging on on social media as soon as the as soon as the incidents in um, in Israel began taking place. But the thing to notice about COVID nineteen forty eight, which was a signal that ran above the rest of the noise and became actually started trending on Twitter, was that all of the most prolific authors were self identified Iranian accounts. The vast majority of those accounts were all created on the same day in the same month, which suggests that the Iranians are funding. The kinetic activity in Hamas, they're supplying missiles for, the, for, the, for unloading kinetic packages, even while they may be putatively supplying mimetic packages that, we, that our, our analysis has shown these kinds of memes can stir populist mobilizations and violence, like the kinds that we have been seeing. And so the danger is that the, the violence and mobilizations actually can cause the memes, right? It's like a hurricane. And, and so these forces now are merging between populist mobilizations, between kinetic missiles that are funded by state actors and, and mimetic theaters. These are all becoming one theater in a way that nobody is going to be able to control. The problem with the Holocaust was that it was trying to engineer a way of turning the pogrom into a factory. It was a challenge for the Gentiles to think through how they would do this, but they managed. The engineering challenge of our time appears to be how we turn the pogrom into a social media network. And so I think what we need to do is understand that that's true and stop kidding ourselves immediately that someone is going to be responsible for this. Someone is going to protect the Jewish people. Surely we're a member of somebody's nation. Surely we're a member of, of a world that, of, that has norms and values. We've seen this before in living memory and we have no reason to believe the people who are alive today are any different. So I think we should have a frank talk amongst ourselves about how we are going to solve these problems. Because my guess is if history is any lesson, we are going to be the ones solving them. Zerat Hashem. Pamela, the floor is yours. Thank you, Joel, as always. Yeah, um, Joel, that uh, every time I hear Joel speak, um, it reminds me why I'm so honored to be associated with the Network Contagion Research Institute. Um, so I'm Pamela Pareski. I'm a senior scholar at the NCRI. Um, I'm a psychologist. And um, as Joel said, I'm going to talk a little bit about what anti-Semitism is. Um, and, and thank you, uh, Dr. Small, for, for having us here. This is really a great opportunity to talk about a really important topic. Um, so the first thing is that um, anti-Semitism is what uh, I call a blinding bigotry. Um, Joel and I have talked about this at length. One of the things, one of the sort of special features of anti-Semitism is that it blinds people 
to the bigotry that it is. Um, as a term, it was created by Jew haters, but it's, it does not require hatred of Jews in order to participate in it. Um, it doesn't require um, a, a specific thought about Jews as a people uh, being uh, a, a, a hated group. In fact, what's, what's easiest about it, part of the reason that Jew hatred and um, anti-Jewish disinformation are both so easy and have been so long-standing is because um, part of the uh, special nature of it is it's, um, it's designed to make you think that you are a good person in participating in it. Um, so when uh, in the 20th century, when uh, anti-Semitism was uh, in Europe, the idea that Jews were not white, white was the morally good category. Um, and Jews were um, uh, outsiders and imposters who were categorized as not white, who were uh, pretending to be white and were you know, taking over things that weren't theirs. So some of these, I'm gonna share my screen and show some of the, uh, from that same report that Joel was um, showing. This is a, a table of uh, elements of various um, anti-Jewish conspiracy theories. Um, so if you look at the, I'm not gonna go through all this, you can just look at it while I'm talking. Um, in the 20th century, the idea was that uh, the Jews were not European, were not white. They were this fictional category of Semites. Um, that sem there is a language, a Semitic language, but there aren't Semitic people. So this was a, uh, a category then that was created in order to um, represent Jews as not us, as not belonging. Um, in the 21st century, now, we have this um, blindness to anti-Semitism that doesn't look like that. And what we have is a complete reversal where the current anti-Semitic um, uh, conspiracy theory is that Jews pretend not to be white. So the 20th century, Jews were pretending to be white. Now, Jews are pretending not to be white. Whatever the morally um, acceptable category is, Jews will not be that. Jews will always be the enemy to the morally good. <clears throat> and so as Chloe was saying, I wrote down some of the, she, by the way, I'm so fascinated by Chloe's work and I think this is gonna be incredibly important, especially when she talks about the meaning of words, how Jews are coded. So Jews are now coded as everything that good, decent people are supposed to hate, right? Zionists are imperialists, colonialists, racists, and even Nazis, right? So anti-Zionism is anti-that. How could you not be anti-Zionist? If anti-Zionist is anti-imperialist, anti-colonialist, anti-racist, anti-Nazi, you must be anti-Zionist if you're a good person, according to this anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. Um, so I'm, uh, I will essentially leave it there, but uh, just to say that um, hating Jews is the, um, is the canard about anti-Semitism. The thing that makes people blind to it is they think, I don't hate Jews, I am therefore not participating in anti-Semitism. I am not an anti-Semite. I don't hate Jews. I have Jewish friends. I like Jews. Um, but you also hear people say, um, how could it be anti-Semitic to believe that Jews control the media? They do, right? People literally say that. And you can ask them, oh, what, what Jews? What Jews control the media? Well, I, you know, I can't point to any exactly, but we all know this, right? These are the kinds of things that make it so easy for people to just be captured, to be recruited. And especially, sadly now, especially people who are particularly concerned 
with being morally good, with virtue. The people who are most concerned are often the, pe the people who are easiest to recruit into this incredibly um, dangerous um, uh, anti-Jewish conspiracy theory. I I'll just say one more thing. The attacks that we're seeing across the world right now, violent attacks on Jews, um, intimidation, destruction of synagogues, um, the, the, the um, rhetoric, uh, intimidating and threatening rhetoric, um, F the Jews and rape their daughters, that sort of thing. People are explaining this away by saying, well, it makes sense that there would be an increase in anti-Jewish sentiment right now because of what is going on in Israel. The thing that is blinding about anti-Semitism is that is anti-Semitic. It is anti-Semitic to believe that attacks on members of a group are a legitimate outgrowth of anger about what other members of that group have done. Right. So I'll, I'll just leave that there. Cool. Um. Yes. So thank you. Um, so I'm going to, Joel, you wanted to say something or? Well, I just wanted to conclude with, with a couple of thoughts based on what Pamela was saying, which is that, look, guys, it, it seems to me that, that our data is now at a place where we're showing that these that anti-Semitic memes and language that they're they're upstream predictors of of violence that emerge in the real world. They're upstream predictors of anti-Semitic violence. Now, my guess is we're going to do the study. My guess is that's true for these quote anti-Zionist memes as well. When we look up the anti-Zionist memes and we're doing analysis on them now, the top association with anti-Semitism is a comedy. The top association with anti-Semitism is the word not. not. <laughs> it's not anti-Semitism, right? That's the that's the number one associated word with anti-Semitism and in words that are about Israel committing genocide. And you look up the take take out the word anti-Semitism with those comments, and it's most closely associated term is not or isn't. And so that what what's ironic is that if those memes are actually causing violence in the real world, you have a perfect double blind. The thing that isn't anti-Semitic is an upstream predictor of anti-Semitic violence, right? That's impossible. And I think it shows ways in which we're fundamentally connected to each other as Jews. It betrays the ways in which we, the, 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 the common interests that we share. The other, the other sort of blinding- You know, I'm oh, sorry. I, I also wanted to, I'm gonna give a talk as well. So Pamela, go ahead and then I'm, I'm gonna speak. Ah, yes. So the other, the other blinding thing I just wanted to piggyback on what Joel said is that, um, that there's a new thing now in saying something isn't anti-Semitism. And that is, how can it be anti-Semitic to criticize Israel and not criticize Jordan and Egypt? Because Jordan and Egypt are also Semitic countries. So that's the new thing, that new idea. Sorry for interrupting there, no Dr. Small. Okay, no, okay. So first of all, th thanks Chloe and Joel and Pamela for your brilliant work and uh, important comments. So this is a special ISGAP event and there'll be another one on Thursday. And it's basically a response to the explosion of anti-Semitism globally. And I'd like to thank Chloe really for putting this together and being the initiator um, for this. And I think so my comments are sort of coming out from speaking with Chloe and speaking with other uh, academics and students, particularly graduate students who are experiencing and I'm choosing my words carefully, an onslaught of open and naked, aggressive anti-Semitism in the universities, the place where the sanctuary, where we're charged with debating, exploring ideas and discussing and learning from one another and reading. And the silencing of Jewish intellectuals, Jewish faculty, Jewish students, especially those who have the audacity or the chutzpah to deal with issues of contemporary anti-Semitism is nothing less than appalling. And the universities, the places that are safeguarding ideas and notions of citizenship is a front line in Europe and North America in the battle, and I dare say the war against the Jewish people. 
and it's a war and it's a war that's informed by ideas and i'll say one thing quickly if anybody thinks that the ira definition is inappropriate and that there's not a connection between demonizing israel and contemporary anti-semitism all you have to do is read the headlines of the last month the violent social media messaging young people being accosted and beaten on the streets of montreal toronto new york london los angeles paris the list goes on and on and if people are so dishonest that they will not make the connection between the demonization of israel and anti-semitism throughout the world then they're just not being honest so the ira definition uh, unfortunately has proven its worth in the last month if nothing else number one the intellectual environment um, and this is why i think the work of isgap and chloe and joel and pamela and the countless other scholars connected to isgap and, and scholars doing work on anti-semitism is that in the battlefield of ideas i believe we have if we have not lost the war we're being slaughtered in the battlefield of ideas and this wave of anti-semitism i would submit to you is grounded deeply in our society it's grounded in thought in philosophy in social theory in the social sciences and this should not be shocking to anybody who understands the history of universities it was these universities that are now pressuring uh, bad jews out of their faculty positions or their their places in graduate studies as we speak it is these institutions that did not accept the Jewish students and faculty members when religion was the dominant way of perceiving reality. The Jews were the wrong religion and they were not worthy to go to Oxbridge or the Ivy Leagues or to McGill or University of Toronto. And during the time of Nazism, it was the scientists, it was eugenics, it was theology, it was the, the social construction of the Jew as the wrong race that prohibited them from going to these universities and having uh, all sorts of quotas at Western universities in Europe and North America. So we have to remember that the universities in and, the, in and of themselves has a horrible history of blatant anti-Semitism and racism and sexism and homophobia and exclusion. So why today should be different and why intellectuals are tricking themselves to think that they're different, one should be careful. I would like to, I would like to say, a, somebody's um, mic is on. I would like to mention Edward Said, who is at the forefront of this sort of uh, battle against the Jewish people in the universities. Edward Said actually wrote that he was the last Jewish intellectual and that all the other Jewish intellectuals were in the suburbs of America living the good life. So speak about classical forms of Christian anti-Semitism and the notion of the replacement theory. Said becomes the Jew. And then, of course, we have sophisticated Holocaust revisionism, where the Jew is the perpetrator, the Jew is the Nazi, the Jew is the colonizer, the Jew is the racist, and the Palestinian is the victim of Nazism is the victim of colonialism and this is sophisticated social theory of, of of the highest order at universities throughout the world as we speak so imagine that so re replacement theory holocaust revisionism as the dominant form of social sciences now i see erwin kotler is here erwin for 20 years has been saying that if israel is an apartheid state from a liberal human rights perspective, we would be morally and politically and legally obligated to dismantle it. And this is this mem, this demonization of Israel as an apartheid state is not only horrific in terms of the history of South African people who suffered under apartheid, it's horrific in terms of its, the, the invocation of anti-Semitism in the university, in the social media, in public discourse as we speak. In terms of racialization, last week we had a Holocaust survivor, Mrs. Landau, 
Mrs. Landau spoke about how she was taken in, from Poland, put in a ghetto. Her father, brother, and sister escaped the ghetto. They lived in a forest, off, living off of insects and worms and, and plants. Her brother died of starvation in the arms of her father. Her mother disappeared, and she was taken to a pit, a pit with her younger sister and father, and her father shielded her as the Nazis shot the Jews into the pit. And she was, she survived, her father shielded her, and in the night she crawled out from under the bodies, crawled to a farm, and she was nursed back to health. But she was, her family was exterminated because they weren't white. And now the intellectuals, people in the human rights movement, is saying to the Jewish people, as Pamela so eloquently said, it's, you know, you're, you, know, you know, sorry we made a mistake and exterminated six million people and subjugated it, and destroyed, and and destroyed European Jewry. Jewry. It's not sorry and welcome to the club. It's now you're white, you're white elitists, and you are the cause of all the problems in the world. Yep. Racism in America, the war in the Middle East, it's the Jew that's responsible. So imagine, imagine this, this is, this is what's going on, not just on the streets where the thugs and the shock troops are, are marching on the Jewish people. These are, these are the media of record and the universities which are perpetrating these lies. So my question is, do universities know the Jew? Do we learn Jewish thought, Jewish wisdom, Jewish history? Do we understand at the universities that Israel is not a colonial entity, that if you read history, if you read the Torah, if you read the New Testament, if you read the Koran, there have been Jews in that land since the beginning of time, that it's not a colonial entity like Canada. Canada just unearthed 250 graves of children from a Christian missionary school. In, in, in Canada, 250 bodies were now discovered of children, of indigenous children. In Newfoundland, the British hunted the biotic people, the indigenous people of Newfoundland. For 132 years, the last biotic woman died in 1876. She was the last remaining biotic people of an, a person of an entire nation. Canada, the United States, Argentina, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and the descendants of these people are now saying that the reestablishment of Israel, not the establishment, but the reestablishment of the homeland for Jewish people is what? I'm not a psychologist, Pamela's a psychologist, but projection is a very powerful thing. So I'll end my comments there. And I think the purpose of this, I see a lot of familiar people on the screen, friends of ISGAP, which is wonderful to see. But I hope that um, some of the uh, scholars at Cambridge that Chloe's engaged with, some of the young people who have been misinformed, who have critical views, who may not disagree with what Joel, Pamela, and Chloe have been saying, and myself have been saying, to engage in a respectful discussion, debate, I think would be very important. So I turn the floor over actually to Chloe. And if you want to... Um, lead the questions and answers and debate, feel free. So thank you. That's great, Charles. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm happy if anyone else wants to jump in with the first question as well. Um, Pamela, did you, was there something that you wanted to say earlier? Um, you should go ahead and address this first. I've got things to say, but I'd like to hear from you. Okay. Um, so I just had a couple of thoughts on um, the role of the university, just picking up on some of Charles's concluding points, um, thinking about um, the university as um, a very specific site, not only of knowledge production, but also of uh, community formation and the troubled and tricky history of certain universities as well. Um, and the ways in which certain faculties at certain institutions now require um, almost a statement of morality in order to take part in those processes of knowledge production, which um, 
are an unequivocal um, dismissal of any attempt to engage with the complexities of um, the conflict in Israel. And this becomes translated into a question of morality and ethics and specifically of the ethics of producing knowledge. So I find that uh, very difficult. I'll also maybe just mention that um, we can also think of the university in terms of uh, what Jacques Lacan described as a set of discourses. It's a type of language which appeals to um, existing bodies of knowledge to legitimize it. And what instead, maybe as Lacan might suggest, we should be interrogating is the unconscious drive to do so. When we look for reasons to validate those unconscious biases towards um, looking for stereotypes, um, to justify things that seem morally simple to us. Where is that con where is that unconscious compulsion coming from? Why are the Jews and the Jewish state fetishized as an example of legitimizing those unconscious biases? And to what extent is that um, fueled through the history of myth and the very specific history of anti-Semitism in terms of conspiratorial thinking? So those are just my initial thoughts. Um, yeah, what does everyone else think? <laughs> I, I would, I, I think that's interesting and I'm and building on that and also um, on what Dr. Small said about um, projection, which I think is an important insight and an, an important thing to uh, pay attention to is that whatever the accusers are doing, they, they accuse Jews of doing. So global domination accused by Nazis, right? Um, uh, wealth appropriation accused by the, the Russians, right? I mean, so in this case, we are now seeing um, uh, indiscriminate uh, targeting of civilians is the accusation um, uh, against Israel. It's, that's the opposite of what they do, and it is exactly what Hamas does. So, you know, these are the, um, you know, uh, baby killers and, um, y y you know, I mean, the, the, the group that uses people as human shields is accusing Israel of, of uh, uses people as human shields and targets civilians, is accusing Israel of intentionally killing children and targeting civilians. I mean, so this is the, the projection, right? Um, the other thing is that when we see the statements of support now, um, once it became clear that there, would, that there were global attacks on Jews outside of Israel, um, uh, when we see these, um, uh, attacks happening, the, the statements of support, um, first of all, are, um, uh, are what people are sort of mocking now as the all lives matter statements of, of support, right? We don't have um, people supporting Jews um, and, you know, full stop. Um, what we have is uh, these sort of watered down statements against all forms of bigotry, et cetera. Um, but also we, we don't see a lot of it. We're not seeing as much support as we would have expected given the level of denouncement that we saw when the Pittsburgh shooting happened, when um, Poway happened. And what that really illustrates is that as with the anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, Jews are being used. Jews are not actually the um, object of support. Jews are the object for denouncing the hated other, for denouncing whoever's hated more than Jews. <laughs> right? So when it's real Nazis, real neo-Nazis who are perpetrating crimes on Jews, there's lots of support for Jews because that's how you denounce those you don't like, is to support those who are the victims of it. But now it's more complicated because, because of the, the narrative that, that we've all been talking about, most specifically Dr. Asher, uh, I mean, Dr. Small said, uh, you know, the, um, 
the uh, the narrative that that uh, you know Jews have displaced and colonialized uh, this area where the real indigenous people are not Jews. Um, those real indigenous people are the ones that are now currently perpetrating the the violence against Jews. So it's very difficult now to find support for Jews because the enemy of the Jews in this case is not the right enemy. Um, so that's where we see that that anti-Semitism actually even comes into play in supporting in, in the support of Jews. Um, yeah. So I'll I'll uh, I'll stop there. Just to add to that, like I think what we're seeing now basically is that it's the height of hypocrisy and it's a passion play. I mean, you have explicitly colonial ideologies throwing the decapitated heads of the corpses that they've conquered in Israel as an object of disgust for its colonialism, you know, which in uh, towards the Jewish people who have been the subject of that particular threat for thousands of years. And in fact, I think what, what Charles said was exactly true, that if you look at the components of, of anti-Semitic conspiracy, whether it's that the Jews are arrogating a kind of special racial or national privilege, that they're aspiring to replace everybody, that they're trying to commit genocide, that they dehumanize others, that they pretend to be something that they're not, and that they're trying to rule the world. Well, that seems awfully true about the Nazis. That seems awfully true about the, the contemporary white supremacists. It's true of the communists, and it's true of the caliphate. So trying to destroy you and commit genocide, are we? Is that what we're doing? So I think that we have we have what's at issue is that that the the uh, the institutions of 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 the of the modern world I think in many ways that the kind of the 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 post World War II order is is now essentially under threat and I think that that as that order decays as usual people are turning towards anti-Semitism uh, and throwing up their hands helplessly otherwise. In terms of how they how they renegotiate a meaningful world order in the face of the complexity from social media, from these populist movements, from the ability for people to infiltrate and influence uh, individuals, networks, and states in ways that no state can control, and the only states that are successfully controlling this are the ones that are trying to make it more out of control. So, I think that that we have a significant challenge on our hands, and the question I think we're facing now is how we how we map this. So the front line, as, as Chloe and Charles, I think, pointed out, are the universities. Those are always the front lines. And we're seeing suspicious activity from foreign nations and funding operations that might be at play in those as well. And that has a lot to do with social media, too. Um, so what we're doing now and what we're proposing to do is to use a kind of mapping technology to forecast this. We need to understand the actuaries of the risk. If the people who are coming from us believe in social justice or they believe in white supremacy, it's irrelevant. We need to map it. We need to forecast it and we need the truth because the truth is what's gonna keep people safe. Whether that means legal campaigns that, that can trace down causes and find people and not accounts or ideas, but find people to hold accountable. We need to find, create tools and maps to do that. This is what the Network Contagion Research Institute is setting out to do. It's work that Charles and I are involved in together. And I think it's the key to being able to manage the, this kind of plague of anti-Semitism in an increasingly complicated world. Thanks, Joel. Chloe, do you, do you want to identify somebody for a question? Or I say, there's some people in the chat. Um, what would you like to do to, to involve other people? Um, I mean, just from a technical point of view, it was mentioned that people might want to ask questions like, as a panelist, I don't know how to do that. So, okay. um, <laughs> um, if anybody would like to ask a question, just raise your hand and I'll unmute you. So I'll help with that. Sorted. <laughs> I actually just wanted to, um, if I may, just make a very quick point just about this question of the universities and some of the difficulties. Um, and I really wanted to stress something that Pamela mentioned, which I think is so important and which I kind of alluded to in my opening remark, which is this has become a question of virtue. Speaking about these issues has become a question of morality and silence is seen as a sign of complicity. 
And it's not, and we're not talking about speech in the sense of having a meaningful informed dialogue necessarily. We're talking about speech and speaking out and activism as a form of circulating, um, circulating text, which presents bloodless abstractions. And so another way to think about the difficulties and the complexities of this is to invite different uh, narratives to speak and to center the Jewish experience, to let Jewish voices legitimize and define what anti-Semitism is, and also to recognize that the Jewish experience is um, multifaceted and far from monolithic and is an entire culture and history that is worth um, celebrating and listening to in its own right, rather than this bloodless abstraction, which can then be filled with every single abhorrent uh, set of meanings that fit the type of conversation going on. And that would also mean that uh, the trope of the good Jew versus bad Jew would hopefully lose some currency as well, because we would start to see um, how complicated Judaism is, and maybe that not one fringe Jewish voice speaks for all Jewish voices everywhere, and that a Jew in the diaspora is having a very different experience from a Jew elsewhere, for example. The other aspect of that, Chloe, is that that, that good Jew idea, um, the anti-Zionist Jew, is uh, the the idea that how can, I, how can Zionism be anti-Semitic if Jews are anti-Zionist, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so it's really important to understand anti-Semitism as something that doesn't require hating Jews in order to be able to discuss the anti-Semitic nature of some of the anti-Zionist rhetoric. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, thank you. So, you know, if I may, Marlene Grossman, professor in Montreal, research fellow at ISGAP, you made an interesting point. Do you want to share it with the group? Hi, everybody. <laughs> so um, my daughter attends uh, OCAD University in Toronto, um, and she started a Jewish club uh, two years ago, just as a way of Jewish students to sort of mingle. Um, it was never meant to be anything big or just as a way to, to get together. And um, what happened was the Center for Diversity and Inclusion sent out a bunch of pro-Palestinian memes. Um, and so she found herself in the center of the storm because one of the students in the Jewish club was actually one of the students written about in the National Post um, last weekend. Um, he was given a concussion by a bunch of pro-Palestinians running after him um, after, after a rally. And, and so um, he clearly is still very angry and she just found herself, Hillel Ontario has now gotten involved, um, Hillel U of T, uh, Sija and so on. And they're trying to support them, but she is now in a position where she has to explain to the Office of Diversity how those pro-Palestinian memes are anti-Semitic. So she, as a student, is now educating these people. Um, and so she has a meeting this afternoon with the administration to, to explain how these memes um, are anti-Semitic. It seems very backwards. Um, and, and she, for a non-political kid, has become completely overwhelmed and coincidentally is leaving for Israel next week. Um, to have an internship for the next two months. So um, she's very involved and feels completely overwhelmed by all of this. So it was just a way of highlighting what's happening, which is they, them, the universities themselves, I don't think know enough to, to differentiate um, what is or what is not, or don't care enough. I'm not sure which one it is. So that was my little two cents. <laughs> it's important, thanks Marlene. Yeah, I, I want to just, um, I just want to say that what your daughter is doing takes courage, unfortunately. And, um, and I, this is, this is the time when that courage is most necessary. Um, so first of all, I, I thank you for raising a daughter who would do that. And, and I want you to thank her. I mean, it, it actually gives me chills because there are so I've heard from so many young people who are afraid to speak up in, in favor, I mean, in, in defense of anything uh, in this realm, um, in, in anything that does not signal the right kind of virtue is a socially sort of dangerous um, position to take. And um, especially at that age, it's very hard to risk losing 
friends, to risk losing reputation, et cetera. Uh, and unfortunately it is a real risk. Um, so, but it's a real risk because not enough people are willing to speak up. Once enough people are willing to speak up, then the whole house of cards will fall. But right now, it's right now is when it takes courage. So I just wanted to say thank you and encourage all of you who have children uh, to encourage them to have that same kind of courage. Thank, thank you. you. So Daphne, are you able to see people who want to ask questions? Yep, so they have their hands raised. Stephen okay. Cohen um, okay. was the first one. So you can go ahead and ask your question, Stephen. Okay, thank you very much. I wanna thank the panelists for this very informative um, session. I have a question and um, a comment. Um, my first one is, uh, everyone is aware of AOC's um, anti-apartheid. Israel, is Israel is an apartheid state. Um, why was there no censure or um, repudiation of that from Congress at all? Zero. And um, is there, uh, there was no mention of it on any of the major media outlets, CNN, Fox, as far as I know. Is there a, um, do you think there's an anti-Semitic bias within those major media, media outlets? We all know that as far, and I'm not trying to diminish or say it's not necessary, the, uh, you know, all the, uh, publicity and coverage of the George Floyd and all the racial terrible things of black men. But it's almost like, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter is the only thing that matters. And, you know, anti-Semitism is bad, but it's not as bad as um, uh, racism. And my, my, my comment is, you know, I found it interesting, this whole um, Jew, Jews are not really white, Jews are white. I'm a jazz musician, and I remember playing on a cruise ship, and we were in one of the, I was in a discussion with a, the, the, I'm a sax player, and the drummer is black, and he said, you're not really white, man, because you're Jewish, and then now it's come to the point where oh, uh, you know, J Jews are white colonialists. And um, just in my closing thing is how it's pushed under the rug, the Myers Leonard incident in uh, Miami Heat, where he was on this uh, playing a video game on, uh, I think, Twitch. And he, he, he yelled out, kike bastard, get him, you kike bastard. And um, the owner of the Miami Heat is Jewish, and he was obviously horrified and let him go. But there was no um, denunciation from any any NBA players I saw. And then I would see on Twitter, oh, I didn't, you know, people, I didn't know even, never heard of that word by, you know, young people. So I, I, I guess it's just an overall statement that this really, since that time, I really have been, um, starting to feel the anti-Semitic um, reverberations in the media and internet. Thank you for uh, listening to my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, thank you for your comments. Uh, next, can we ask Barry Klarman to ask a question? Yeah, Barry, you've been unmuted, so you're able to ask. Hi, thank you to all the panelists for putting this on. I, I just love listening to ISCAP all the time. It's such good material. Um, my comments and questions regarding anti-Semitism are, I look at it um, from a lens as an early indicator of societal instability. And um, because of the reasons we've articulated here, it's pretty much oblivious to most people because of the nature of anti-Semitism. So it's an early indicator. And as uh, panelists have mentioned, it's. Uh, it's kind of a tool and, and the Jews are besides the point a lot of the time for the motives of what um, movements want to achieve. But we feel it first, which I think would 
behoove us to raise a loud voice that says, hey, something's happening. There's movements here afoot. And um, so my question is regarding um, uh, the, the, the rise of anti-Semitism now, is what do the panelists feel is the potential, as in the past, of this rise in anti-Semitism expanding beyond Jews, right? So if you look at it from a society standpoint, you know, we looked at like the, the, the um, Inquisition, you look at the Nazis, you look at Soviet Union, rise of suppression, we're talking about that. Jews of the former Soviet Union have really raised their voice now of, of all the red flags, um, but it's bottom up. Of course, it's peppered with little in, in um, pol politicians too, which is concerning now. Um, but then you also on the far right have li little fascist populist type tendencies now. And so, like we said, it's coming from multiple different directions, of course, but, but the Jews and anti-Semitism is the tool for the goal of like, let's say control or suppression or power. So um, I worry about increases in risks for uh, civil rights, human rights abuses, human atrocities, and um, the role of civil society in terms of public service, mayors, police, that, that sort of thing. What do you think the risks are of this escalating rather quickly or just escalating if I, outside if I may, of the Jewish community? If I may, Barry, what I would submit to you and to the listeners here is that it already has. I mean, that you, we, we're now seeing genocides that are being committed using social media. The events of January the 6th, there's, there's an interesting thing to, to think about there. You know, we, we warned the executive leadership of Twitter. We spoke in front of Congress. Um, people, the chief, the, the chief of intelligence for the Capitol Police is a member of the Network Contagion Research Institute. He issued reports before the attack happened that Congress was the target and that, that uh, there's a war coming to DC. Of course, he would know that. He's written some of our reports with us. One of the reports that he, he wrote warned about the, the a revolutionary group that was threatening to seize lawmakers and go in all at once to do that. And, and that was QAnon. And these were, these were a lot of the myths that in our analysis were intrinsically necessary to, to foment this. Now, the interesting thing about the problem is that what we've learned from January the 6th is that the platforms are permitted to determine which threats they're going to monetize that erode our democracies. When those threats erupt, they've shown that they're the ones who are going to be in charge of the censorship policies for who should and should remain after they've monetized them. Whoever else has won the revolution on January the 6th, and I actually don't think we know the answer to that, by the way, but whoever else has won, it's clear the platforms have, because that suggests that they're becoming sovereign. These runaway processes that appear too large for individuals or nations to govern are an ecosystem for the development of new techniques in anti-Semitism. When those techniques emerge, they threaten everybody. It's easier for everyone to pretend that they're not being threatened when the everyone is represented by the Jew. So whatever it is that's happening to us, it goes without saying this is going to be a problem for democracy. It always is. But it's gonna be a problem for some people in particular. For the people who have mobs, who can establish facts on the grounds, they don't need the truth. They don't need the actuaries, they're creating the actuaries. But there's some people who need the truth in particular that rely on it and have an old relationship with it. So whatever else is true about the disinformation that's out there, we better stop kidding ourselves. We better stop kidding the students on campuses. We need to stop lying to them. Their lives are going to be in danger. We need to have a frank conversation with them immediately to that effect. We should let them know that if someone tells them that they're a social justice warrior, just join my group, or know you're really white, or whatever it is, that's not what they're going to be. They're going to be Jews. Thanks, Joel. Uh, we have a question from Chitty. May I just really quickly respond? Chitty Babu Padavala. I'm sorry for <laughs> mispronouncing your name. But you're welcome to ask the question. Chitty Babu. Is he unmuted? Yes. Cool. Yeah, I think he's joining up. There he is. Thanks. Hello. 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 Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, 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 so I'm not a native speaker, so I'm not sure I, I uh, caught everything you said. 
but it, it, this is my impression that uh, mostly the focus is on uh, the description and uh, its connection with the uh, widespread violence uh, against jury and also the systematic nature of this anti-Semitic meme making and propaganda uh, hashtags and all that. Uh, but this is all remains uh, at the level of describing the situation. Uh, but uh, it is short on the causality and particularly uh, why, uh, why some people obviously not anti-Semites, uh, including some Jewish studies scholars uh, willfully participating in this. Uh, it is not that everybody is an anti-Semite and they got an opportunity so to express their anti-Semitism. It is not like that. Uh, there could be some more uh, to it. Uh, it seems to me, it appears like some kind of an anti-Semitic international is happening and left is left and anti-Zionist academicians are uh, at the forefront of it. Probably the calculation could be that, okay, let us mobilize this dissent initially and it can anyway be uh, turned against America uh, and also it charges up uh, Islamic world. Uh, probably eventually it will open up some possibilities to turn it into pure anti-imperialism or anti-Western uh, domination of the world. Uh, so uh, uh, you, whatever you may think about my proposal, but uh, if, if we can discuss something about the causality of it, uh, why now and uh, who those who are obviously not anti-Semites, not hoping to eliminate Israel, uh, why they are participating in this, why they are providing a cover for it. So thank thank you. you for your important question. Anybody from the panel? would like to address this very crucial question. I can talk. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I, to hear from I, I wanted to make sure that Chloe did this talk. No, I can try, but I can, I'd also like to maybe bring in a conversation from the chat as well from, because I think it's asking the same, I think it's at the, it's operating on the same impulse. So the question is from uh, Rob Scott. Um, an amazing colleague of mine at Cambridge. How should a non-Jewish person who is troubled by the Israeli settlements and violence in the West Bank and Gaza engage in criticism and discussion of these phenomena without reproducing anti-Semitic tropes? Is it possible? I often feel scared to talk about these things for fear of saying the wrong thing. So I think that at the heart of this are these conversations about how do we engage meaningfully in these types of conversations um, without reproducing tropes that are anti-Semitic and also um, to what extent can such an can such an activity be even possible where we take into account the identity of the speaker, for example, if they are Jewish or not Jewish. Um, my answer to this would be for anyone that wants to engage in meaningful discussion about the Jew political situation in Israel, Palestine situation with Israel and Hamas um, is to pay as much attention to the geopolitical crisis as you would also pay to the history of anti-Semitism itself, to understand and to recognize the tropes that you are recreating, perhaps with some of the words that you're using, with some of the biases that you're leaning on, with some of the things that you're trying to legitimize. Um, there are, the IHRA is a great place to start. Um, it, just, it defines what anti-Semitism is and being as specific as possible in your discussion and with the words that you use um, with the particular incidents that you are describing, rather than taking this out into the abstract, is a good place to avoid um, accidentally, we assume, falling into anti-Semitic tropes. And then on the question of why would people who perhaps on the surface not appear to be intentionally anti-Semitic for whatever reason engage in these things, it goes back to everything that we've been saying, that this has become an issue of morality, which has become simplified and flattened into um, binary language. Do you support this? Are you against this? Are you anti this? Where do you stand? Opening up the conversation um, and engaging with the complexities of it is a good way forward. Um, I'm not gonna speak to the motivation of why a person may do or not do a certain thing, but that's a good place to explore motivation in the first place. Yeah, also, and um, Joel and I both have a hard stop at 12.15, uh, but um, <clears throat> which is now, so I'll be very brief. 
Um, one of the things that I heard a Palestinian activist say was if anybody wants to talk about nuance, everybody, anybody wants to talk about the details, if anybody wanna talk, wants to talk about any of that, there are only two answers. The one answer is uh, that's a lie. And the other answer is that doesn't matter. And so, and what Joel said is really important about the Jews relationship to the truth. There is a reason that we have a culture of argumentation and attachment to the truth. And that is, I think, fundamentally where our problem lies right now, not just with the, with the issues in the Middle East, but because the idea of knowledge production and, and standpoint epistemology and this new concept of objectivity and truth is, is ascendant. And that is not the Jewish way of, of uh, approaching yeah. evidence and truth and, and, and seeking truth and our relationship with the world and knowledge. That's, right. that's a great point, Paola. And that, I mean, it, and that's, I think what's funny is that the truth and Jewish identity, in my opinion, we, we, the moral minimum for how we encounter the problems with anti-Semitism have got to be on the basis of a commitment to our shared identity and, and, our, and our shared history. Because it turns out that that's true. <laughs> and it turns out that that, that that carries the truth with it. So I think there's a moral minimum for us to have a posture of, of, of combating this where we see it, not on the basis of being anything other than what we are, but actually as Jews, a civil rights movement that, that predicates the existence of Jews as a free people actually. And, and if people say that that isn't true, well, that's exactly why that decision can't belong to them. And I think that, that that's where this is gonna come down to is my sense. So if I can follow up, I think, uh, Joel, I like your call. We've had these discussions before. I really like this perspective. Um, and I think to Robert Scott to also provide a bit of a, a response to what Chloe mentioned is, is your question. I remember when I was a student at McGill University in the 1980s, uh, I attended a course by Professor Sam Numoff, and Erwin knows him, remembers him. And I remember he gave a lecture on apartheid South Africa. And I was a kid, I was 19 years old. And I went up to the professor after the class that he gave on, on South Africa and apartheid. And I asked the professor, you know, when did apartheid end? And he looked at me, I was sort of a young, naive kid. And he said, you know, Charles, it's still going on. It still exists. And I was shocked. And I asked him, like, when, when do you think it will end? And he said, we, you know, we don't know. It's pretty entrenched, a system that's, that's entrenched. And to make a long story short, I became involved in the anti-apartheid movement. I was actually the chairperson of the African National Congress Solidarity Committee of Canada. I went to South Africa uh, on the invitation of the ANC. I was involved in pre-negotiations. We, we were running programs um, in, in Europe and in other parts of the world. And my, my point to Robert is, as a young Canadian, Jewish, liberal, human rights activist, I became involved in the anti-apartheid movement and, and the ANC in part because I believe that this was a social democratic, broad social movement to end a racist apartheid system. A system, by the way, that was rooted in Nazism and fascism and anti-Semitism. And as a progressive young student and scholar and human rights activist, I became involved in a social democratic movement to end apartheid. And Robert, what I urge you to do is read the People's Charter of the anti-apartheid movement and the people's culture that was invoked in the anti-apartheid movement. And please read the Hamas Covenant. Please read the Hamas Charter. Please learn about the Muslim Brotherhood because this is the foundation of the reactionary social movement that is trying to liberate the Palestine from the river to the sea, to annihilate the Jewish people. In their constitution, in their charter, they not only call for the elimination of the state of Israel, they call for the murder of Jews. They subjugate women. Women are not free to travel around on their own without the permission of an adult male member of their family. They advocate the killing and the, 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 the subjugation of gay people. They don't believe in religious pluralism. They don't believe in the notion of, of democracy or citizenship. So how young, progressive Western people 
could be lending their support to the most pernicious reactionary social movement in the Middle East or in the Islamic world, which also, by the way, targets and kills their own people. How many Muslim, moderate Muslim people have been attacked, marginalized, killed by political Islamism? They're the largest victims of this reactionary social movement, which fuses European fascism with a very specific narrow notion of Islam. And how progressive white liberals could be in bed with this pernicious movement is irrational. And when people, smart, educated people act irrationally, something is fundamentally wrong. So I urge you, equate yourself with the people you're supporting. And these people have to have agency and they have to live by a morality. You can't call for the extermination and subjugation of identifiable groups, and then people in the West pretend they're progressive. It's not possible. Okay, on that note, <laughs> any any other questions in the chat? So Trisha has had her hand up for a bit. Trisha, you're able to unmute yourself and speak. Oh, there we go. Okay. So um, I tend to be a pessimist. Um, so maybe I'm approaching that this way, but I'm very uh, disheartened about what's going on. You know, I see, I mean, I love his gap. I love, you know, these very bright people, uh, with these very convincing arguments and facts, but it doesn't seem to matter. Um, the other side is just snowballing exponentially. I mean, since even with Jewish violence against Jews, like that's not convincing even. You know, student unions are are signing on to BES. It's just gone very mainstream and just speeded up in this last month. So um, what, what do you think is to be hopeful about here? What, what do you think would work to counter this? What is there to be hopeful about? And the only thing that I find any hope in recently is that there are non-Jews, very bright non-Jews, who are anti-critical race theory, anti-critical social justice um, theory that have recognized this anti-Semitism through that movement. Like um, Yasma Muhammad, she's an ex-Muslim, uh, counterweight Helen Pleprose, Peter Bogosian, the new organization FAIR, and the Jewish community has woken up this last month. I think they were, you know, had their heads in the sand and all of a sudden they're aware. So that's the only thing I see that's hopeful happen. But, you know, I see excellent arguments being made, but people just don't want to listen. You can't make a sound bite out of it. It's too complex. People don't want to learn. I don't, you know, what's the answer? <laughs> I, uh, I'll try to answer. I don't even know if I have, and I, I don't think there is an ultimate answer, but I think what Joel touches on that's really important is that um, I think Jewish people really need to understand the situation that we're in and the, the forces against us. And, you know, when I was involved in the anti-apartheid movement, I actually became involved with some of my teachers were, were, uh, at the forefront of the black consciousness movement and a key element in the black consciousness movement was instilling a sense of pride in who African people were. And I think particularly in the United States, we need to reconnect with our, our wisdom, our heritage, our history, our amazing culture and the contributions that we make to society and take pride in it. And I also think that we have to, in a sense, stop focusing on just allowing other people to understand our struggle. And I think if we develop a strong narrative, a strong inner voice within our community that's more united <clears throat> and more conscious of the, of the struggles we're fighting, I think that would be an important first step. I think people 
even our enemies will appreciate a strong Jewish community, a, a community that our members take a deep pride. We have a lot to be proud of. And, and I think even within our, the Torah and our teachings and the wisdom, we, we, we have plans, mechanisms to deal with this, the, this situation that we face. And I think we should learn, learn from that too. And I think I'll just add one more thing. I think being educated in Jewish thought and in Western thought or in other thoughts enables us to see things that most people don't. Having the ability to have two forms of education, at least two worldviews, is a powerful advantage. Um, and I think we should we should learn who we are and, and take pride in it and don't allow forces to to remove that or, or water it down. I think Georgette, Georgette Ben Simo. Okay, I think that's the last question we might have time for today. I'm going to unmute you, George. Georgette? Yeah, I'm trying to unmute. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, I did write a comment. I didn't have a question because I'm very aware of what the situation is. I try not to be pessimistic as Trisha is. I try to be optimistic and always see the light coming through, as Leonard Cohen would say. Uh, but um, as I wrote a comment, and to me is education, education, education. I'm a, I'm a, a docent at the Holocaust Museum in Montreal. And I'm always amazed at the surprise of the students when I ask them, what is the population of the Jewish Jews in the world? And, oh, they say so many millions or this or whatever. And when I tell them it's 14 million, in, including the diaspora, um, they're very astonished. So facts have to be underlined, um, have to be um, put in front. And when I compare to the Muslim population, which is 2 billion, and I have to explain what a billion is. So to put it in perspective, and the students go, oh, really? So, and then to explain that throughout the world, we've been a minority and that's why we've always been targeted because it's, all, it's always easy to uh, persecute a minority. They cannot defend themselves. And that was the case, whether it's Russia and North Africa and Morocco, wherever, or in Poland. And to give those notions to the people who are attacking us so they understand, um, to, to uh, uh, open up the Koran to the people, let them read the Koran, let them read the Sharia, and let them conclude what this is all about. As you said, uh, uh, Asher, to read the, the charter of Hamas. Why don't people read the, the, the charter of Hamas? It's right there, black and white. It's evident, it's, 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 it's so evident, it's, it's incredible. So uh, let, let people assist in, to a Shabbat. Our Shabbat is, is full of peace, peace, peace. We're praying for peace. We're, nations shall not swear, uh, 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 raise their sword against nation and peace from the beginning to the end. I mean, I'm not even talking about people who pray every day. Um, compare that to the Muslim prayers that they say five times a day, which is full of violence. So there is, there are ways of putting up the truth there because people are not aware, they're not educated and they're not, they don't know the facts. Put up the, the protocol of Zion and, and, and show them what this is all about and how it influenced the rest of the world. There are some intelligent people in the world that will conclude this is, you know, this has to be done. I, I in my optimism, I'm a little too optimistic. My thing would be to, we have, we have manifestations in Montreal galore now. It's really, it's, it's alarming. Uh, uh, they're the, 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 the pro Palestinian people are in Côte Saint-Luc, which is the area where most Jews are, um, uh, going around with cars and saying, we're going to rape your daughters and blah, 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 and all the rest. Who died and made them king? Why are we, why we not allowed to, to live like normal people? If this was about Asian or Black, people would be appalled. And, and here, Le Devoir, which is one of the main French uh, 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 newspaper, just published a caricature of, of uh, an Israeli soldier with a knee on George Floyd. 
uh, to tell you the truth, that was like the la good qui a fait déborder le vase. That's the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back. Everybody, I think it shocked the, the Jewish community and they finally reacted. Um, and, and this is coming too close for comfort. We have to educate people. We, I, I, tr I try to see that there's a hope because otherwise I would just want to so, die. Uh, so we're out, out of time. So I just want to make one more comment. I was speaking to a colleague. It was only in the 1950s at Yale University that a group of historians got together to look at the impact of racism on slavery. Okay, I kid you not. The idea that slavery was a racist project was not in our worldview. It was not in our education system. It was a group of progressive, radical historians that started to look at the issues of racism and slavery. People like W.E.B. Du Bois and others were writing it for a long time before, but this eventually became part of the university system. We can look back now at Nazism and fascism and racism and slavery and the Shoah, and we know eugenics wasn't science. We know all of these ideas are now debunked, but the danger that these ideas brought to the Jewish people and to throughout the world is profound. And I, I don't want to sound pessimistic, but I think that the, the lexicons, the, the, the social theory, the discourse in the universities in the media of record is very serious. And to undo yeah. this, it's not, you know, you know, people don't always, uh, as Bob Dylan said, you know, all they believe are their eyes, but their eyes just tell them lies. And you speak of Leonard Cohn, his song, The Future, is uh, maybe apropos to, to this conversation. So it's, uh, we have big challenges. And I think turning to the wisdom and the, and the knowledge in our, in our heritage and our culture is, is, could empower us to, uh, to stand up to this, uh, this issue. And it's not going to go away. I think Joel and I are of the many people see these issues uh, are going to be around for a, a long time. And they're very challenging. So we have to become aware and knowledgeable and I think fight as a community. And uh, from a strong community, maybe people will see what we're trying to achieve. If so I may note, say, I what? don't know if you know, but Noah Tishby, who just wrote a book called Israel, yeah. the most unknown yeah. country in the world, giving arguments to students on campus yeah. to be able to defend themselves because against BDS, against all these things, um, it would be a good thing to suggest for people. We, who we, have, to, we have to end here because we went way over time. Um, I want to thank Pamela and Joel and Chloe. Thank you so much for initiating this. I appreciate it. We all appreciate it. And El Shaday and Daphne, thanks for the technical support. Uh, next, is it's this Thursday. I'm giving a talk on issues we're dealing with it. If Israel is an apartheid state and uh, Jews are white elitists, what are the implications? So that will be on Thursday. So more fun and optimism on Thursday. Um, so everybody stay well and be strong. And uh, as they say in Yiddish, you have a setter. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank cool. you. Thank, Thank you. you.